Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon and welcome to The Post 19, Summoning a Meaningful Life. This is the end of our Fight Back trilogy and it has a provocative, disturbing and pretty frightening trigger from a direct message I received on Twitter. So we're going to quote it. Here we go. Quote, Dear Professor Brabazon, Firstly, let me express my gratitude for your work. I love the post. They have been very helpful and I hope the project will continue successfully. You encourage people to give you ideas, questions, suggestions that you could explore in your vlogs. So here's mine. I'm a former academic who decided to move to industry after I completed a PhD in molecular biology. The management of my university was rather poor and at times the environment was toxic. As a result, a lot of my colleagues found themselves needing professional help, taking antidepressants, therapy, etc., taking leaves of absence, avoiding work, and even dropping out of the PhD. I was also severely affected at times, darkest moment of my life. And at the moment of my graduation with a rather good thesis and decent publications, I felt relief more than anything else. After my PhD, I received several postdoc positions. I refused them all and decided to move to industry. Because of the fact that most projects these days require multiple researchers, I found myself in a position where my efforts, work and commitments benefited the same people who were contributing to a toxic work environment. I was comforting colleagues who were mistreated in a major way by people in positions of power in the afternoon and in the evening I was putting the names of those people on manuscripts since they were part of a team and contributed in a minor way to the project. The conflict between loyalty to my colleagues as well as my own experience and the expectation to maintain somewhat of a respectful and friendly relationship with the team leaders even though their behavior was awful was difficult to accept and impossible to negotiate with myself while i managed to escape and found myself a new job the question still remains in my head how can you justify working for somebody who can bring out the worst in people, make them doubt themselves and feel horrible? More importantly, how can you justify running projects and publishing when you know that your work will directly benefit these people? Is it not being complicit to poor behaviour. At which point can you no longer say that you're quote one of the good guys but actually you become part of the problem validating the actions of your leaders. Perhaps the question can be even taken to a broader context. How can you remain proud of being an academic knowing that you're part of a world that contributes to the poor well-being of those around you. Is it even possible? End of quote. Now, this was a very, very long message and I've quoted a lot of it for many reasons. Firstly, I think it's incredibly powerful writing. When I read it on Twitter, I uh, became very emotional, I cried and it, it stuck with me that day, it stuck with me the following week, it's still with me and you can feel emotionally uh, I, I'm not quite managing. It is a powerful message and we all need to answer the provocative question here. How can we live with ourselves if our behaviour serves to benefit people who hurt others? How can we continue to be part of an academic world that contributes to the sadness and the despair of students and of colleagues? Now, I'm 53 
years of age. And I received my first academic job 31 years ago as a teaching apprentice. I've trained 189 graduate students through my career, tens of thousands of undergraduate students, and research and teaching and community service and caring for colleagues, university service, those functions have been my life. But what's the point? That's a really powerful question. And look, I'm going to answer it. I'm going to provide 10 answers to that question. Whether you are currently in a university as an academic or a student, you're watching this aspiring to be part of a university community. Perhaps you've had enough. You've chosen to leave our university sector and move to another industry. Or perhaps you are an academic, a courageous academic, occupying those new alt-academic spaces. So I want to talk to you today honestly about how all of us, whatever our positioning, how we can live with ourselves and further how we can assist and enable others to behave better and to enhance and improve our sector. Now I am aware that it's an increasingly difficult time to do academic work. And there is no doubt that some of the best academic work that's been conducted is occurring outside of our universities. Think about that. But let me provide some salve today and some answers. What's the point? Why are we doing this? Here are 10 answers about how we can enable and support and block those who wish to do harm to others. Here are 10 decisions we can all make that return us to having pride in being a scholar. One, seek out and understand research integrity and the research codes of conduct. Now, most research codes of conduct have their origins in the Vancouver Protocol. Now, let me show you how research is actually constituted, how it is measured and how it is evaluated. Basically, there are three parts of research that are assessed and evaluated as part of research integrity and research codes of conduct. There is, of course, research design, Secondly, data collection and interpretation. And finally, writing and editing up the results. They're the three parts of research. Now, authorship on publications requires that every single one of us that is an author on that publication demonstrates substantial contributions to two of the three of those categories. Therefore, start to familiarize yourself with the phrase research integrity. Seek out in your nation the research codes of conduct and have a good look at the Vancouver Protocol. Now, this is increasingly important because in the last five years, most publications now ask that every author signs off in granular detail their contribution to particular publications. So you can make a difference today in your life and the life of colleagues around you by upholding research integrity and research codes of conduct. So every single time you research, you write, you publish, remember to use this policy suite. Whenever authorship or publications emerge, just make sure you send an email to all the prospective authors with a list of the policy, whatever your nation is. Here is the authorship protocol at our institution and nationally. Mention research codes of conduct and why they matter so much is they ensure transparency and evidence in the determination of authorship. Now, you are not on your own here. The reason I'm talking about policy is it's not about you being terrible or being frightened or being worried about what these really powerful people are gonna to do to you. We've all got your back. 
Deputy Vice Chancellor's research in universities around the world, sometimes it's in a provost suite, but there is a person, the buck stops with them for research integrity. They are the Deputy Vice Chancellor Research. And remember, most of the journals we're publishing in these days, they demand that we sign off and we uphold standards of authorship. So just remember, this is not about you as an individual, you against the world. It's the exact opposite. Start to lean on policies and procedures and codes of conduct. You are not alone. The system will protect you. Learn about research codes of conduct. And when we be the change that we want to see, research behaviours will change. Two, maintain a commitment to teaching and research and the relationships between them. Now, workplace policies at the moment are pretty bonkers. They're separating out, slicing off the different functions of academic life. So teaching only academics, research only academics, education focused academics. It was never meant to be this way and it shouldn't be this way. This separation of teaching and research actively destroys academic life. What makes higher education different from further education, HE different from FE, is that the people who teach the students also construct the research. So in other words, we make the research, we develop the knowledge that we're teaching in the classroom. So teaching and research are aligned. So therefore, we need to overtly make this point these days. And so I've made a commitment every year now that I will publish SOTL, the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, and SOS, the Scholarship of Supervision, every single year. Because what SOTL and SOS do is they build and they confirm the relationship between teaching and research. So through SOTL and through SOS, we have to force ourselves to build the relationship between teaching and research and publish on that relationship. So therefore, by maintaining the link between teaching and research, we never give up on the importance of teaching as a mode of dissemination for our research. Three, know your rights and know your policies. Right, policies exist to empower the disempowered. If you ever hear, and we hear it a lot, if you ever hear academics abusing policies, abusing procedures as a waste of time, and then of course laughing and ridiculing policies, then you need to watch that person. You need to watch that person. Because policies exist to configure a minimum standard of behaviour. PhD supervisory policies exist to protect students and they demand that supervisors enact in professional training sessions and these policies demand that supervisors do not exploit students or sexually abuse students and this is no laughing matter. Therefore respect regulations because they create transparency. They also create accountability. So know your rights and further, know that there are people in our university whose primary job, their primary role, is to protect and look after students and early career researchers. Policies matter. They exist to protect you and they are needed because we have predatory academics. And these predatory academics treat students like slaves. So you need to understand who is in charge, not who your line manager or your supervisor is, who's the big boss, who is in charge, who is in the powerful role to uphold the policies to enable 
and support you. So remember, you are not alone. You are never alone. There are policies in your institution to look after you. Universities are bigger than any predatory individual or a toxic lab. Four, understand and publish in platinum open access journals. Yeah. Now, platinum open access journals are very, very special journals. Authors do not pay to publish. Readers do not pay to read. So nobody pays platinum open access. Now, why this matters so much is we live in an era where particular corporate uh, businesses are colonizing academic publishing, of which Springer and Elsevier are the clearest examples. So what happens in gold open access, for example, let alone silver or green, is that authors often, and certainly universities, are having to pay huge sums to these publishers to ensure that people can read that work for free. So authors have to pay to publish their articles. And some of these costs are astronomical. For example, Nature requires up to $11,000 to publish an open access journal. Now, of course, Nature is owned by Springer. You, we, can make different choices. We can make a decision today to publish in platinum open access journals. These are journals run by courageous academics, courageous institutions who are giving their work of free and support for free to ensure knowledge is available for all. Wow. And you'll find these journals through the directory of open access journals, www.doaj.org. Org. and they list all the platinum open access journals. So therefore, if you decide to publish, authors and readers are not having to pay over and over again for what taxpayers have already funded. Five, support great research and great researchers through citation. Courageous ethical researchers deserve support and while that remarkable researcher who messaged me on Twitter confirmed the dreadful behaviour from dreadful academics and he wondered how he could live with it, I think we need to make different decisions. I live my life differently. I never, never support bad behaviour. I don't write with the dreadful people. I don't acknowledge the dreadful people. I cut them out of my life. I do not cite them. Bye, Felicia. So the poor behaviour, the unethical humans that work in our universities, simply cut them out of citation practices. And the best way to promote ethical and decent behaviour in our universities is to support those people. So cite the great scholars. Seek them out on social media. Say, I read that great article. I read that fantastic monograph. Congratulations. It's great work. So when you watch a presentation on YouTube and you love it, then find that person and send them an email. So do not contribute to those appalling people and their profile and their behavior. Instead, build positive relationships with those who are behaving ethically. To give you a current example for your consideration, the group that are now known as the ultra-realist criminologists are a growing group of remarkable researchers and they're being marginalised quite strongly at the moment by British criminology for many reasons. But the work of Steve Hall, Simon Winlow, James Treadwell, Thomas Raymond, and Oliver Smith, my respects gentlemen, the work that these gentlemen are producing is absolutely stunning. 
and I believe they are producing some of the most important work on the planet today to understand the conditions of our lives and our social structures. Now, I cite it a lot and I support it and I'm speaking about it today. And can I say they've just started a new podcast series, the Ultra Realist Criminology Podcast that is housed on YouTube. So you know what? Seek it out. Click like, support it, reach out and create a different intellectual culture. Six, recognize and deploy the power of deterritorialization and digitization. Oh yeah. Now, many universities and many university academics are locked in what I call the bubble. An inward, insular, nasty little culture. Now, we're starting to see a radical split in our institutions. It's fascinating and horrific to watch. A small, uh, pretty powerful core of tenured staff who have worked in very few institutions, maybe worked in one or two countries and have a very, very small intellectual experience. That's one group. And then we have this enormous group of casualized, temporary, precariat scholars, academics who are living on their wits every single day and mostly living in poverty. In the last 10 years, and I would argue particularly in the last five years though, that secondary group now has new ways of finding each other and new ways of disseminating their research, particularly through digitization. So Morris Smale and Marina Regaldo confirmed both the affordances and the barriers that are configured through digitization in higher education. So this is important. Don't get lost in internal politics and rubbish. Don't get lost in that bubble. Don't feed into the micro power held by these micro academics. Instead, use the great deterritorialized capacity of digitization. Build relationships beyond your institution. Force yourself to be a scholar of and for the world rather than an inward scholar locked in an office, a lab, a minor institution, in a minor suburb, in a minor city, in a minor country. Seven, know that academic life is not linear. You can and will move between different jobs and different sectors. Now, my correspondent is currently working in industry, and that's brilliant. And he used the phrase that he has left academic life. But what I want to suggest to him and to all of you is this notion that an academic works in an institution for 30 years is ludicrous. It's been ludicrous really throughout all of history, but it's just completely wrong in the last 10 years. Academic life is not linear. And it's certainly not singular. The future of academic life is all of us will move in between different jobs and different countries and different ways of being a teacher and a researcher. I often think of universities like Swiss cheese. So we're in the organisation and then we simply drop through the hole and find something else fabulous and do interesting work in another location to then return at some point and back into the university sector. Now the alt academic movement, very important, confirms this. There are alternative ways of being an academic and there are different ways of doing academic work. So if you decide to work in industry, and this is what I would say to you. If you decide to work in industry, then please, for me, keep publishing. It may not be in the areas that you did your doctorate on, and that's cool, but find different areas where you can publish. In the case of science without a lab, it might be science communication, it might be citizen science, it might be science education, science le leadership. Think of those areas where perhaps you don't need a lab. Give yourself deadlines and continue to publish. Now, I know it feels like universities have failed you. And yes, they have. But I need you to continue to believe 
in the purpose of a university, what a university can be. And a door will open in the future, and I hope that the university that opens that door to you is worthy of you. Eight, don't leave the labels that the bullies and the narcissists place on you. Those who don't follow a particular narrative arc or trajectory in academic life are labelled and they're labelled by those who have never had the courage to live alternative strategies, ways of thinking. The dire context of higher education at the moment means that there are thousands of brilliant scholars that have simply had to discover alternatives to pay their bills. Now that is courage. That is real courage and trust me, you've got nothing to prove. Nothing. You don't have to put up with labels from anybody. You're not a failure. You're not a loser. You're the exact opposite. You have survived in dreadful times. And you've discovered alternative ways of thinking and being and doing. That's powerful. And you deserve respect for that. Now, Anne Geetz Kaiser and Mark Boven published a remarkable book that I enjoyed very much, Why Knowing What to Do Is Not Enough. What a great title. And they showed the consequences of maintaining particular assumptions in your life about values and behaviour and yet living very different experiences outside of those values and behaviours. And that creates all sorts of problems. And I think that's what's created the concern from the person that wrote that message to me. They have notions of how life should be and their experience is countervailing of that. So those of us who have suffered the injustices of higher education, we know what you've gone through. We get it. And we share your rage and your anger and your disappointment and your despair. We share it. We also know that everything you have experienced will transform higher education. Your compassion, your kindness, your deep thinking about difficult ideas will transform higher education. You understand the difference between conversation and manipulation and feedback and bullying and those differences are important. Nine, if you leave, learn. If you leave, learn. Now this great phrase which I become a bit obsessed with, if you leave, learn, comes from Wendy Dwyer. Brilliant. It's incredibly important for you, for us, for all of us who leave universities and do different type of work, that we don't give up. Do not give up, please. Do not give up. I want you to continue to learn. I want you to continue to plan professional development programs, continue to publish and give yourself deadlines. Whenever we leave an institution or an industry, we need to learn from that leaving and therefore refresh and reboot the next stage of our lives. And yes, 10, remember that your vulnerability is a strength. A PhD has been framed and described through much of its history as preparation for an academic workforce. That's always been wrong but particularly now. A PhD has always been so much more than this. A PhD is a remarkable qualification. Yes, it is research training, but it's also education in persistence and planning, and you gain deep expertise, disciplinary literacy, but you also gain a commitment to the big idea. Now, only 40, 40, only 40 percent of PhD students, graduated PhD students, stay in our universities. But even that's a bit of a ruse, 
because within our universities they are employed within a diversity of roles. So for example, yes teaching, yes research, but a lot of PhD qualified colleagues are working as professional staff as well in a diversity of roles. So most PhD students leave our universities. Or indeed, let's not forget the huge group, the increasing group of part-time PhD students who are in full-time work, often have a great career, they enrol in a PhD part-time, and so they never leave industry, they never leave their job, they simply get a PhD and hopefully are promoted and kick on again through gaining that degree. So if you leave universities to work in industry or diverse institutions, then actually you're in the majority of graduates. You're in the majority. You're doing what most people do. So you're not vulnerable. You're not a loser. Change your perspective. You have handled adversity and you are moving beyond a threat mindset and you're moving into a growth mindset. You have made a decision to not take the easy way out. So what I'd ask is set realistic expectations for yourself, maintain minimum goals of research and communicate and disseminate effectively what you are doing. And also know that building confidence is a process. You have made a decision, a really powerful decision. You may feel vulnerable, you may feel unworthy. George Sheehan stated that, quote, success means having the courage, the determination and the will to become the person that you always believed you could be. End of quote. You have made a decision to make a contribution to the world beyond personal goals. And in a selfish age, that is remarkable. You are asking the difficult questions. Who are you? Why are you here? You've made a commitment to open up your mind with persistence and flexibility. And you've opened up your mind to transform and transcend. You have made a decision to take a positive action every single day. And this is the very definition of courage. And it's sourced from vulnerability. You are an inspiration with the trajectories that you are creating. You are our future. And I want to thank my remarkable writer of that incredible message for his courage, his inspiration and his power. I thank him for his vulnerability and I thank him for the courage that he's built from it. It remains a model for us all. I wish you love light and peace. Tea out.